Welcome back, everyone, to Inclusive Design 2023, brought to you in partnership with our Platinum supporters, Google and Antopia, and our Gold supporters, Barrier Break and Tetralogical. You can follow us on Mastodon. If you have any questions for the presenters, post them using the ID24 hashtag or post them in the YouTube chat for our Q&A at the end of the session. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and you can find our code of conduct on the Inclusive Design 24 website. And now I'm happy to hand things over to Ian, my guest host. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Hans. Um, next, we have Sarah and Jabi Kibura, who is a senior developer advocate at Spotify, talking about adoption, contribution, and bringing about cultural shifts in everyday developer workflows, amongst other things, in a presentation entitled Accessibility Advocacy by All for All. The floor is yours, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah and Jambi Kiburu. I am senior developer advocate at Spotify. I am from Nairobi, Kenya, but uh, because of my work, I live in uh, I live in Sweden, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm very excited to be talking to you today. Um, so before I start, I wanted to share something that I um, that's really important to me, and that will also help lend context for what I'm going to talk about. Um, I was recently in a podcast uh, where I talked with my colleague about um, accessibility, uh, my journey into accessibility, and uh, why it matters and why I think more people should begin to think about it um, in the everyday work that they do. And so uh, the waveform you see at the bottom of this first screen and uh, in every screen that there will be in this slide um, is a Spotify code and it will take you to that um, accessibility podcast episode that I recorded recently. So how you um, can access it is if you go into your Spotify app um, and into the search bar, there will be a camera icon um, on one end of your search bar and you'd be able to use that to scan this code and go directly into the episode. But in case you don't have the Spotify app or if the steps get mixed up for you, um, I'll highlight it later in my presentation uh, so that we are all able to have access to it, should we like, um, and listen and share with other people. Right, um, like Ian said, I'm going to be talking about accessibility advocacy by all and for all. Um, and this is <laughs> a subject matter that will draw a lot from my uh, career journey in tech and how I got into accessibility um, and how I've sort of uh, adopted it for my everyday work. Um, and I'll try to tell my story um, with uh, and punctuate it with uh, maybe ways that you can begin to think about um, introducing accessibility into your everyday work in case you've been looking for entry points or um, how you can advance it where you've already been doing some work here and there, especially if um, you are not a trained accessibility expert. I, I am not one um, and we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, so I've divided my talk into three sections and um, We'll talk about why accessibility matters. I'm sure everyone who's in this conference already has a good idea, but it doesn't hurt to go through those again. Um, and then we'll talk about the importance of solving um, accessibility matters um, for people that need it, but also how that benefits the majority of the population. And then we'll also talk about how to do or introduce this work um, into our everyday workflows in a way that is sustainable. So outlives us, um, should we leave a project um, or should we hand it over to someone else? Or if, even if we sunset it and people pick it up much later when there's no one to give them context for what has been done, how can they continue to write in accessibility and uh, prioritize it? 
And um, I will also say that a lot of what I will be talking about um, is from a um, technical standpoint because my background is in computer science and I worked in uh, open source on different projects um, and with developer communities for a little over 10 years before joining Spotify about two years and three months ago. So that's um, the premise on which I will base my talk. All right, so let's talk about why accessibility matters. Um, and we'll start by, um, uh, you know, borrowing from the five common senses um, and applying uh, accessibility questions to them. Uh, <laughs> we might skip um, sense of smell and one other, uh, which don't quite apply, especially on the web, uh, and we'll focus on the common senses that apply. So thinking about site um, for any project or any work that you do, a good starting point to consider how accessible your work is or how accessible the application, um, the tool, the resource you're putting out is, is to ask yourself, um, how, how do people um, with Daltonism um, or near or far sightedness experience your applications and your tools? How do blind people interact with your with your tools, um, have you considered them at all? Um, on on one side of my presentation, um, you will see a famous piece of art, um, which is very ambiguous. Um, so if you look at it keenly, um, it's it's been drawn to be uh, deciphered in two different ways. You could easily have seen a duck. Um, at first, or you probably didn't until I said that, <laughs> or you could have seen um, a rabbit. Um, so what might be the duck's beak for one might be the rabbit's ears for another. And, and this is great. It works really well when you're thinking about art, because um, it can be in interpreted in a million ways. But when it's a uh, different functionality in your tools and applications, this is a disaster. You do not want people um, getting confused by what it is you are requiring them to do or how you're requiring them to interact in your application or get to the end goal, um, because then that's frustrating and you're creating um, you know, an equal experiences or you know, um, adding extra hoops for people to jump over before they're able to get to the end point or the end goal that your tool or application um, is designed to help them accomplish. Let's think about the common sense um, that is hearing. Um, so on, <laughs> I, I like this meme. This meme was um, very popular in African Twitter because um, there's many different languages. I said I'm from Kenya and there's about 44 recognized languages and they do not sound similar. Um, I, I do not know 43 of them. I only know one of them, my mother tongue. Um, but then, and then in other countries, there's also many languages, there's 54 countries across Africa, and many of them have many different languages. So um, that in itself creates a problem when people are communicating, but especially verbally, um, it creates extra, extra challenges. And so if someone was saying yes, and they said, mm-hmm, or this, if they were saying no, and they said, mm-mm, or if they wanted to ask you what, and they said, hmm, you know, like these are things that are interpreted the same, no matter what language someone speaks, um, spelling notwithstanding, because I, I don't think I'd spell this, <laughs> this um, expressions the same way, but if someone were to say, mm, mm-mm, Mm -hmm. Like I would understand what it is they were saying, um, but this is a this is a real world example, um, very far fetched from what we're talking about, but I quite like it. Um, so if we consider a sense of hearing, um, and in applications where people have to listen out for instructions or uh, where you're giving verbal cues for things, how then would people that use your applications or tools in say loud environments, so they're in traffic and it's super loud or they're at a school playground and uh, children are on break uh, of pe or people who have impermanent damage to their ears or people who are hard of hearing or deaf, how will they interact um, with your application where the only um, 
avenue you're providing them is verbal cues. So how do you work in um, different ways for them to interact with your application without feeling left out or that they have to bookmark it until they are in a quiet place or that they will actually have to ask someone else for help or forfeit using your application altogether. So that's something you have to think about. Um, and on the other end um, of, of the sense of hearing, if you think about talking, um, so how do people who you know are nonverbal or people who have heavier accents, um, so like my English will sound different from someone who's who's natively uh, spoken English in their lives, um, or or people with illnesses that would affect their vocal cords and how they enunciate words. How will they interact with your platform um, if you required verbal cues um, for them to move from one stage to the next? What alternatives are you working in for them? And how much longer will it take them to get to where they, they need to get vis-a-vis -vis someone who, you know, gave the verbal cues that your application, your tool, your resource requires? And sense of touch, if you think about it. So how would people navigate your applications or tools, um, say, if they have only one arm at their disposal or no arms at all, right? Um, so think about people who've been injured. I think about parents <laughs> with children in their arms. Think about you or someone who's gone shopping and really has um, limited uh, use of their hands. Or, you know, just people... Um, who who don't have uh, their limbs um, um, to to use to interact with your application. So how do they do that? Are there non-touch um, capabilities worked into your application? And that would allow people to get to where they need to get uh, without having to maybe spend 10 extra minutes to get there. So that's those are some of the things that I've had to think about um, um, from from my standpoint over the years. And it's been it's been a very helpful exercise um, to begin to think about um, some of these questions. Uh, some of them are difficult. And I will say, uh, if for nothing else, they should prompt you to start to find people that actually have these lived experiences and talk to them um, because um, they are your users, right? Um, so you could spend, uh, a lot of time reading, a lot of time researching, but I will say the best way to um, maybe start testing out these scenarios or to start understanding them better or at a deeper level, um, other than these high level questions I've sort of shared with you, is to talk to people who um, have these lived experiences in their everyday. Um, I, I attended virtually the International Day for People with Disabilities. There was a conference in December 2020, a one-day conference, and the theme was not all disabilities are visible. And just that theme alone is something I've carried with me. So we've talked about the common senses, but you surely have to think about people who have, say, chronic fatigue, mental health conditions like PTSD, OCD, bipolar, depression, and anxiety, um, people with autism and ADHD, uh, people who get things like migraines, and so they can't be on screens for long, for example. Um, you have to think about people with learning difficulties like dyslexia, which is difficulty um, with reading, or dyscalculia, uh, difficulty with numbers, or dysgraphia, difficulty with writing, and things like this. Um, and consider these people, say, if you're gamifying uh, your tools, your resources, your applications, are you creating extra hoops for people with disabilities that are not necessarily um, visible, um, or that, you know, the first, if you consider the common senses, you'd sort of miss out on uh, these uh, other disabilities and designing for that. So um, it's these are really good pointers um, or questions to think about at the very onset and at least um, begin to uh, talk to people with these lived experiences and find out why it is that they will struggle with your current flow in your application, your tool, your resource, and then uh, begin to find out what are some of the experiences in everyday apps that they really like or what specifically would benefit them um, if you worked into your application.
so talk to people. Um, so solving for all, um, <laughs> we, we are all aware of this resource, um, but I wanted to highlight it. Um, so this is where I started. Um, and I think it might be a good time to give a background about how I got into accessibility, maybe accessibility advocacy um, after, you know, following these guidelines for a long time in the open source projects I worked in. So what happened was, um, I, I um, sort of referred to and used a lot of accessibility resources over the years um, as I worked on open source projects, different open source projects, but then 2020 came um, and we found ourselves in an environment where one, we could only convene people online. And a big part of my job at the time was running um, uh, conference or speaking at conferences and running workshops to upskill people um, with different uh, tech capabilities um, and speaking at conferences about the work we were doing. And so I had to think about how to do this well, particularly the workshops aspect in an environment where um, you're not interacting with people in the room, um, Zoom or, or uh, other um, conferencing tools are the only resources available to you. Um, I would also organize tech conferences and thinking about how would we uh, make those um, have, you know, like a really good experience and accessible experience because it's a whole different world. Um, and so I had to move from uh, reading resources about, you know, working in accessibility, primarily into tech resources I was building and begin to think about um, the spaces where we were convening the tech communities as well. Um, and in a way that would also benefit the people in the community. So I was in a community with about 50,000 people, the carpentries, um, and all these people uh, would come together and write, um, write courses to, to teach people how to code, and then they will run workshops themselves. So the um, thinking about how to run accessible uh, workshops online, accessible conferences online needed to be done at a scale where not only was I implementing it, but people in different time zones were also implementing it. So I had to figure out a way that worked, but also worked, write a guide to help other people run this um, time zone specific workshops because we couldn't run the same workshops across time zones. That would have been a disaster. Um, and so that's how I sort of, you know, um, had added responsibility um, around accessibility. So I had to do a lot of reading, talking to people, but in a very short amount of time, find things that would work, ways that would work and benefit everyone. And then with every conference we ran online, uh, we'd try things and sort of amend the guide um, and things like that. So that's how I sort of moved into accessibility advocacy, like pushing people to think about accessibility as one of the core questions, whether building a thing or organizing a thing um, online or in person. All right, so um, this is a resource I uh, re have referred to time and again and again over the years. Uh, the four principles of accessibility and the accessibility guidelines, the 13 under, under them. They, they offer a really good checklist that I use to audit my work and I encourage you uh, to look at them like so um, and to keep referring to them time and time again. Um, there's, um, uh, there's someone I really respect um, and I like that definition for accessibility that works very well, particularly in spaces where people see accessibility as a good add-on, like a nice to have rather as something that should be uh, considered early often and as core to any to the success of any work that is put out. And Susan Goldsman, who's the author of uh, Play for All Guidelines and the Inclusive City, two, two books I highly recommend uh, for you to read, um, says this about accessibility, that at the heart of accessibility is the notion of designing a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience so that everyone has a sense of belonging. So what this essentially means is your application, your tool, your resource uh, provides an experience for people. 
and no matter the uh, disability, um, you should make sure that they get from point A to Z in exactly the same number of steps. Um, that, you know, I wouldn't have to say, oh, I missed that step or that wasn't available to me. Um, you know, I shouldn't have a minified experience or a subpar experience um, because of my pre predisposition. So provide a myriad of ways for people to have the same experience. Um, so then you are um, maybe leveling the playing field um, for all your users. I quite like that definition. Um, yeah, and so this is, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time here. Um, Exper experientially uh, with a hierarchy for motivating accessibility change. It's not, um, it's not an easy process, I have to say. Um, as someone who adopts accessibility, I have found myself um, in many a project um, sort of being the first person to say, oh, let's improve this and then let's improve that. And, and sometimes it starts out easy um, because you, you're probably adding alt text to images and everyone sees value in that. Um, and sometimes your changes will be accepted quickly because you know, um, if people are not using the same guidelines or checklists or are not privy to them, then they might not question, you know, how lengthy your alt text is, for example. So they accept all changes and sometimes it's really easy. Um, but then when you start making it a collaborative effort and start touching on, say, core code bases or core workflows, then there might be a lot of pushback, right? And so there's ways to motivate change in your team or your organization. Um, you could guilt people um, and let them know by statistically how many people they're leaving behind or leaving out actively by choosing not to make your application accessible. But how long will you guilt people for, right? Um, you could decide to punish them, um, but you know, so if this isn't done at this level, then um, we miss out on this and that. You could require it, um, but the goal, the end goal should be to um, work out a way to get to inspiring people to proactively think about accessibility, uh, to proactively bring these questions to the table, whether or not you're in the room. And that takes a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of um, maybe, I don't say lobbying, but advocating for accessibility, showing um, the value of it, but also um, just allowing people to be in that space where they not only, you can't always ask people to put themselves in, uh, in the shoes of people who are missing out on things. So that will be the guilting and punishing. Um, you should get them to the place where they care even if they have no idea uh, what what other people's experiences look like. Um, they have no idea what um, a deaf person's experience is like or a blind person's experience is like, but they still are driven to do the right thing. Um, yeah, so think about how you will incentivize the work. Think about how you will um, you know, advocate for these changes and in a way that is lasting so that when you're not in the room, people are still asking these same questions for newer projects, for work that you've been pushing for. They are um, stepping up to actually make the changes themselves that are needed. All right, um, because of time, I'll try and move a bit faster. Um, Right, um, there's a really good talk. <laughs> I think Leonie put me on this talk and I really like it. Um, Adrian Roselli said, should all these uh, steps uh, from the previous, should all these um, steps fail um, in trying to fix your tool, your resource um, and improve accessibility in them? Should, should you fail to guilt people, punish them, require them to consider accessibility or inspire them that they are actually at the place where they take ownership of the work? Um, then ask them to do it for selfish reasons, right? Um, <laughs> remind them they will grow old at some point. Um, so they will likely need um, 
more accessible tools or resources uh, in the future. And if they do not start to consider this, especially as people who are increasingly growing into levels of leadership and mentoring others, then the newer developers in the future, for example, will not uh, give accessibility a second thought. And guess who will be on the receiving end? The very people who um, are still treating accessibility as a nice to have right now. It's a very good talk. Um, I encourage you to find it and listen to it. Um, so Selfish Accessibility uh, by Adrian Roselli. Um, the end justifies the means <laughs> sometimes. All right. Um, so uh, one challenge I have found um, in over the years in trying to think about accessibility is getting trapped um, in sort of wanting to have something perfectly accessible before I put it out. And what that has done is it's most times um, delayed making an application accessible, a tool, uh, a resource accessible early on. Um, so I encourage you to not fall into this trap. Um, you, you know, make small changes, small steady changes, um, and, and then improve as you go along. Uh, don't wait to have all your accessibility um, the changes worked into your resource before you now publish it as a big thing, I encourage you to make small changes frequently and put them out. Uh, and we'll talk about why it's also important to communicate about them a little bit later. Um, I'm borrowing from Jason DePel's recommendation on making accessibility into the software development life cycle. Um, so I, I really like this because um, Again, I work with engineering teams. Um, I'm a software engineer myself. And one of the biggest questions will be like, okay, so we understand that accessibility is important. When do we begin to ask these questions? How early should we ask them? How early should we consider them? So that you know we can then work it into the final product. Um, and Jason DePel has this wonderful recommendation of specific places to start to think about accessibility uh, once once a wireframe um, has been designed, um, checking for accessibility before um, it's worked into a thing that needs to be built and makes it into sprints. And at every stage, um, thinking about specific questions to ask around accessibility that will guide um, the inclusion of very important accessibility principles in your final product so you do not wait until it's quality <laughs> quality control time or quality checks time to to start to ask okay why isn't this accessible in this and that way it starts way before way before when your idea um is an idea right uh, so that's when you start to think about accessibility there's a longer blog post about this, I think, um, in Jason DePel's medium. Um, I encourage you to, to read it as well. Uh, it's very insightful. And again, you can use this as a guideline, but then um, do more. Um, there's always room to do more. Uh, so don't feel like this is um, stamped truth. Um, you, you should definitely use it as a guideline and find even more ways uh, to, to start considering accessibility in your workflows. That's the most important thing. I think things are moving, things are changing. There's a framework to actually uh, guide the work. Um, because again, if there's no plan, then you know, um, you'll only do it maybe once or twice and then forget about it. Remember, we want to make it a scalable um, process that stays or outlives your time in a project or can be translated uh, into other work, used to inspire other work. Yeah, um, yeah, so beyond, this is something that has helped me a lot. Um, there are really incredible accessibility resources out there. Um, and that's that's really good. Um, but one thing I've found every time I have shared a resource 
an external resource um, more than three times as a recommendation um, to the developer communities I interface with often, um, then I've realized, well, and then there's been no change over time, then you realize the problem might be contextualizing it. Um, so adopting what's out there, um, the best practices, the principles and guidelines, and then bringing them closer home so that you're helping people win faster. You don't want people to have to read um, best practices and guidelines, especially if they'll refer to them time and time again. It's not a one-off thing. You don't want them to read something um, and then have to think about how to apply it specifically for your project. So if you're able to say, these are the principles. And for this project, we are working on specifically to build this up. Here's how we'll apply them. Um, so then they have something to refer to that has specific checklists for their use case. Then you're helping with people win faster. All right, I'll give a small case study <laughs> about the work that I do. This is my team. Uh, we are uh, a team of eight and we are responsible for something that's called Spotify for developers, developer.spotify.com. So our work is to put out APIs and SDKs um, that allow people, developer communities to build uh, or to extend the Spotify experience by building this really fun and unique applications that um, you know, contextualize the data, the information that Spotify has, uh, for unique contexts, developer.spotify.com, you can have a look at it. Um, so there's APIs and SDKs, like I said. Um, and then we realized that uh, we'd put out lots of tutorials um, and um, starter guides for people to use these APIs and SDKs. And people were building applications that will go really viral and get very many users uh, in no time at all. But um, as part of our guidelines, we weren't asking people to consider the question of accessibility um, so that they were making the applications accessible from the onset. So applications are going out and they will get um, lots of users, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but then the user experience will still lack in some way or other. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that these third party developers were equipped uh, with information about how to make the Spotify um, based, Spotify API, Spotify SDK based applications more accessible. So yes, there are guidelines and yes, we could have pointed them to those, but we decided to work with, this is the accessibility team at Spotify. Um, we decided to work with them to write uh, more uh, detailed accessibility guidelines uh, specific to the Spotify context. Um, and we sort of divided those in three. Remember I said, um, <laughs> you don't have to do it all at once. Um, so we divided those in three, like how can you uh, begin to quickly win and make your application more accessible? So what's a task that could take maybe a day to implement and what, what could take longer, but uh, is totally worth doing and what might take maybe a few weeks and more hands, but is also really important to implement. Uh, so we were very careful to say, although we are dividing them into quick, medium term and intensive wins, all of them have the same measure or the same weight um, um, of importance, uh, but we, we don't want people getting stuck in that rut where everything has to be perfect. So that was the main goal. Um, and yeah, so it's under uh, accessibility documentation. And we thought long and hard about how detailed this will be. And we decided to, um, you know, take our own advice and not wait until the guidelines are perfect, but give people a starting point while we continue to evolve on it. So we are, we are continuing to write these guidelines and we'll keep releasing uh, newer versions of, of these guidelines uh, with the Spotify specific context. And I promised earlier um, that in case you pulled in scan the Spotify code in all of my slides, um, I will give you um, the specific place to go find the podcast um, episode that I, where I shared my experience and anecdotes around accessibility recently. 
Um, so it's in the Spotify for developers on the air podcast. Um, it's the fourth episode. It's called All Things Accessible. Um, I'll, I'll share these links uh, with the organizers and hopefully we can put them in one place, maybe um, so that people can access them. Yeah, so I hope you listen, um, reach out to me if you have questions and share it as well. Um, yeah, so solving for long, how do we make this accessible? Uh, sorry, how do we make the question of accessibility and the frameworks we build um, uh, to help us think about how to work in accessibility into our projects? How do we do that sustainably so that long after one project is done, the frameworks that we carry forward into other work uh, include the accessibility frameworks that have worked well for us in the past as we built things. Uh, David D um, in uh, lead, the Lead Dev Conference in London recently. He's the VP, Vice President of Engineering at the New York Times, um, said this, um, and I liked this quote. He said, when things are not as clear anymore, we should fall back on our guiding principles and values. Um, and so I'll adopt that statement to say that the place to start to make anything sustainable um, around accessibility is to make sure that it is as closely aligned to any accessibility guidelines that are put out by, um, you know, central uh, deciding bodies. Uh, as these guidelines evolve, as the principles become more elaborate, you need to keep yours updated as well, um, because the web is evolving very quickly, and we have to keep things um, relevant. So yeah, keep that in mind. Always um, be as closely aligned to the principles, the core principles, as accessibility principles as possible. Um, so yes, like I said, the first thing to do is to share early and share often. And what I mean by this is um, don't just share the guidelines. Uh, also learn to tell your accessibility stories and to tell them in a place that people can revisit them historically um, so that people know what the decisions you made in the year 2000 about a project were informed by ABC. And then in 2007, you made changes because uh, X, Y, Z changed. And this year you are going back to uh, what you did before because you've experimented a million times and uh, DEF have informed your decision. So share um, publicly what it is you're doing or even within the confines of your organization. Make sure there's um, proper context for why you're making certain decisions around accessibility and not others. So then people who are able to take on after you, or even yourself, because you'll forget at some point, you're able to remember why you made certain decisions and not others. Um, so that's really important, actually. Remember to share your, both your work um, early and often, um, your changes around accessibility early and often, but also tell your stories whether externally or internally within your organization, leave a paper trail for all the changes, decisions have been made, why um, and how, if you're able to, how they were made. Um, make sure you're always learning. Um, I think accessibility and especially on the web is the one thing that requires us to never stop learning. Learn from other people. What are people doing? How are they applying things? You do not need to borrow everything, but you will find one thing that a company has done well and another that has worked well in a different company and you could mash them all together and not have to start from scratch um, in building out your frameworks or bringing about culture change. Um, learn about the principles, keep reading and rereading them, um, check for things that are changing, ask questions, be in spaces where you're also um, hearing from others often, like this conference. So make sure you are in a state of continuous learning open to it. It's very important if your work is to be truly accessible. I'll also say um, everyday experiences are a really good place to draw inspiration from. Um, and so, yeah, keep your eyes and ears open. How are public spaces uh, made accessible uh, for people that need it and how do they benefit the rest of us every day? Um, 
Great. And then consider doing more than adopting the best practices and principles. It's really great that your application, your tool and resource um, are as accessible as possible. They score highly, um, but um, consider doing more and consider um, becoming an accessibility advocate for um, other tools that you use, um, still applying the same questions you would for yours and uh, helping others that haven't thought about it or maybe have thought about it, but you don't see it implemented in the end. Uh, keep pushing back, keep asking questions. Um, I will say um, that Rome doesn't have to be built in a day, but being an accessibility advocate helps people um, either start having these conversations or begin to prioritize it because that's the feedback they're getting, right? That something is good, but it's missing A, B, and C accessibility wise. So um, help be a voice um, and that might help bring about change. All right, um, yeah. And to finish um, from another talk I had recently from Dr. Catherine Hicks, uh, who thinks about developer success in developer workflows. Um, the question of accessibility is particularly pertinent. Um, and a lot of times when we begin to learn about accessibility, at least it was true for me, um, I felt very guilty that I hadn't um, put these questions, or even thought about them before. Um, and, and sometimes you might miss a mark um, in making things accessible. But like I said, I think this is a learning process. And um, the most important thing is that we are making changes that will last, changes that will make um, tools, resources, applications accessible. And we should get out of our own way and try not to lean in too hard on perfectionism as we begin to implement these changes. Um, it's important to make them now as early as possible. Um, but then also consider the question of accessibility holistically. Don't make small changes and then reward yourself and sit back. No, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying do it early, do it often, um, and get out of that rut where, you know, stuck in a, a loop where you're guilty, you want it to be perfect. Make sure you are rectifying your mistakes uh, where you've missed out on making things accessible. Uh, make sure you're helping other people either improve their projects um, or make them more accessible. You're upskilling them. You're telling your stories so that people don't have to make the same mistakes you made or so that people have inspiration to draw from. Um, or that you're actively making sure everything is as accessible as it should be within the projects that you work in. Um, and if you do all of these things, then um, you are modeling something that Catherine Hicks calls re resilient productivity, uh, which essentially means you're making uh, your work sustainable and for long so that it outlives you um, and others are able to carry forward with it when you're not there um, and, and borrow from the frameworks that you have. All right, um, so I'll stop there in the interest of time um, and hopefully there's time for a question, but if not, um, I'll find other ways of interacting and answering them. Thank you, everyone. Right now. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Ian, do we have any questions? I haven't spotted any on the socials, but I do have a couple of questions myself lined up ready okay. to go. Um, Sarah, it's not unusual to get pushback from some developers on accessibility, but can you recall an example where you were really surprised at how enthusiastic a developer or a team were to adopt an accessible approach? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, let me think. I think that will have to be my team, actually. Um, we recently had to revamp uh, the developer portal. So if any, so developer.spotify.com. So if anyone was on it last year um, or before March this year and then hasn't seen it since, it's changed quite a bit. And in thinking about how to, to change things up um, early on. Uh, so the work I quickly highlighted that we did with the accessibility team was late last year. And so when we needed to revamp this project, then uh, it felt like a really good time <laughs> to exercise or um, what it is I've been pushing for elsewhere. Um, and so 
I sort of looked at the principles and then said, I think this is what we need to do while we consider how we want to change the developer portal. And everyone was really keen on it. The bit that surprised me most was um, that everyone went away and read up on what needed to be done uh, to, to make the portal accessible, like they actually studied and then worked it into every PR they'd put in around this project. And there will be specific reviews around accessibility work. And that 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 was mind blowing to me. Um, so I, I loved that. That's the most recent example I have. Yeah. And is there, is there anything that's happened at Spotify, like a, a change that you've seen that really makes you proud? Um, do you mean accessibility wise? Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Yeah, um, I actually think that the core app has come a long way accessibility wise. If you think about where it was at like in 2019 and now, um, a lot of accessibility um, has been worked into it, um, right from just color contrast and things like that to um, uh, voice over in the application and things like that. So. I, I, I do know people put in a lot of work into it. So <laughs> yes, I am mighty proud of the experience I have with it now, vis-a-vis um, -vis 2019, which is when I started to use the app myself. Um, it feels very different, a lot more, yeah. And one final question, is is there anything that you sort of see as a as, as, a, as a challenge that you'd really like to get to, get to, to grips with? Um, with accessibility, yes. Um, I think the bit that I think I I would want to get better at is um, being very efficient in telling uh, stories around um, accessibility adoption into the different developer workflows we've had and the challenges we've had with those. Um, because there's things called developer journeys that people really identify well with, regardless of um, where they are on the web and how they work. And so if we get better about um, more specifically saying, this is where we struggled um, with working in accessibility and here's what we changed then um, and had all the stories coherently told in one space. I think we'd all be better for it. People will see more entry points because sometimes you say do this and people are like, but you don't know the challenge I have. But if we start to share the challenges we had and how we are either actively working to tackle them experimentally or have tackled them successfully, then people see entry points because they identify with the challenge and then they're more willing maybe um, to, to think about accessibility more centrally. So I think um, trying to have a little bit more empathy for the people that have to implement this and where they might be stuck is something I want to do a better job of um, maybe approaching so that we're getting people <laughs> to eventually um, think about accessibility more centrally in their work. So that's that's something actively thinking about. And I would love to hear from others um, about maybe anecdotally what they've done that has worked well in the spheres where they're about, they're trying to bring about culture change in accessibility adoption, particularly in tech spaces, yeah, tech communities. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. No worries. All right, we're, we're going to wrap up this session. Uh, if you like this session, hit the YouTube like button. Don't forget that you can subscribe to youtube.com slash inclusive design 24 to be kept in the loop of future events. ID24 is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Google, Entopia, Barrier Break, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, and the Law Office of Lenny Feingold. Inclusive Design 24 will be back on the hour with our next session. See you then. Thank you, Sarah. Great talk. Thank you. Have a good day.